And so what you've been talking about, navigating prophetic experiences and going through the process of developing discernment. Yes. Really understanding before you take action. Yes. It's really very important. It really is, Rick. And, you know, it's interesting. There's ways to navigate, discern, but then there really is moments in the office of the prophet where the Lord will just download something. Yes, and the, give those you, moments come. They do. And it's a time where there will be an interpretation of an enigma or a gift for it. And we find that with the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament, where Daniel in, in chapter 5, verse 12, it speaks of how he was not only 10 times better and his friends were 10 times better than all the soothsayers, the Chaldeans, all the magicians and all those things. But then it talks about that he had the ability to solve riddles, riddles, riddles. And that word, when I've studied it, it really talks about like an impossible knot, like a knot that you just can't untie and like an enigma. And it's, it's in this position where they, they don't know how to fix it. People don't know what to do. So Daniel had a gift to walk into an impossible scenario. And I think it's a true prophetic apostolic anointing, actually, where you walk into impossible scenarios and through the word of the Lord, either interpret it, correct it, resolve it like an ax head floating, like going into a territory like an apostle where it's impossible to do something, but you do it anyway. And I like what you say, anointing, God gives you the anointing that will move hell out of the way. I believe that there is an anointing that comes on some of these leaders and prophetic voices particularly that will have a now word, an instantaneous revelation of exactly what the interpretation is and what to do and solve the riddle. And I think that's a missing piece in some of our geopolitical issues, some of our church government issues, is that sometimes when the fivefold ministry comes in truly under the word of the Lord, the unction of the spirit, they can say, go to the street called straight, stand there, and this is how it's going to begin to unfold. That was pretty clear. I think that's pretty clear. And I think that is what we're missing in some of these areas of enigmas, navigation, and all of it. We need the true word of the Lord with men and women of God that are clear-eyed, clear-minded. They hear God. They get past the silliness of it all, and they're able to truly be a weapon in the hand of the Lord. So how do people listening to us today find those people that are past the silliness of it all? Well, I think they listen to Rick Renner. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I actually mean that. I think when you inundate yourself in the healthy teaching of the Word of God, whatever your gift is, if you're craving prophecy, you can grow in it. But you can't crave a fivefold ministry office and just become that. No, it's the, the Lord they're, does they're that. They're gifts. The Lord does that. But when you listen to teaching like yours, you listen to teaching over and over again until it just becomes part of you. Your gift is going to come apart or alive by default. Well, you know, you've been quoting Hebrews chapter 5 this week about through the use, you become... Reason of use. Reason of use. Exercise. You develop discernment. That's right. That whole text is about the Bible. Yes. And when you really exercise yourself in the Word of God, you already are leagues ahead of the rest of the gang. Wow. You have a sense of discernment. It's a spiritual common sense. It doesn't take you long to recognize what's right, what's wrong. You're so exercised by the Word of God. Yes. You know, other people are laboring, trying to figure things out. You, already, you have the answer like this. Yep. And it's not because you're so smart. It's because the Word of God really has the ability to develop discernment in you. Yes. That's so powerful. That's one thing I love about your prophetic ministry is because it's so connected to the Bible. It has to be, Rick. It has to be. Or you will absolutely, as a prophetic minister, you will get off. It's not a matter of if, it's when. Because there's so many experiences. I have a lot of experiences. I experience things. I talk about them very seldom, the ones I have routinely and things. Because the Bible says, 1 Corinthians uh, 4, verse 6, learn from us to not go beyond what is written. There's something to be said, though, for true apostles and prophets that are stepping up in a culture and leading the way for the body of Christ. I believe things begin to happen when God's real fivefold ministers walk into their calling, walk in their anointing, and just obey Him. There's something powerful to be said about that. When prophets begin to pray, intercede, and spend time with the Lord, I believe that's part of their process, just like all the fivefold. But there's something unique about the apostle and prophet, and I love your book, Apostles and Prophets. Oh, thank you. Something that's unique, I believe, is this. I believe apostles are chosen. And I believe prophets are grown. 
because of, uh, apostles, it's almost like when I've seen things even prophetically on, on true apostolic leaders, I see the word chosen on them. When I see prophets, it's like they go through, I don't know, fire, hammering, stuff like that. Well, look at the example of the prophet Samuel. Yeah. I mean, he had to learn the voice of God, but we all have to learn the voice of God. We all have to learn. We all have to. But the Samuel story is so similar to yours. It's true. I mean, he heard a voice call him three times. He thought it was Eli. Yeah. And it was Eli who finally had to say, go back and say, here I am, your servants. <laughs> yeah. e Eli had to say, that's God speaking to you. Yeah, that's true. And I think that the, in the prophetic gift, it's true of all the gifts, you got you got to grow in your gifting. you got to yeah. give yourself to it. That's true, Rick. But Joseph, a lot of our people listening to us today, they're not prophets. That's right. They're people who just want to be able to solve the enigma. Yeah, they can hear God. Well, you hear God by watching the broadcast, listening to the Lord Jesus through the Word of God being preached. Pray, I'll use this word, pray in tongues, copious amounts. Pray in the Spirit and pray in the Spirit some more. Spend time in the written Word of God, and the Word of God will become clear. It'll take anxiety away. It'll right-size. It'll sharpen you. And surround yourself with people who have solid voices. Oh, that's important. You know, I have a team around me, and God speaks to me through my team as much as God just speaks directly to me. And sometimes I feel like I have a word from the Lord about how we're to move forward as a ministry, that they will bring that other piece we're talking about. That's so important. And that's the missing piece. And even though I may have a general understanding of what we're to do, like, okay, I'm going to give you an example. Right now, in, in the Russian-speaking world, we have the largest online Russian-speaking church in the entire world. It's amazing. We have about 230,000 people that are active participants. That is a very big church. It's tremendous. That's stadiums of people. It's tremendous. I had the word. I knew what we were to do. But it took everybody on my team to open the enigma because I, I didn't know how to do it. I had the word, but I didn't know how to do it. So when you surround yourself by people that you trust and by people that are godly and you know that they have good common sense, but they have an ear for the spirit. Yes. You begin to bring all the pieces together to open the enigma of what you're supposed to do. It will answer your questions. This is really very important. The Lord wants to answer us more than we want to hear him. Well, Jesus said, you just have to have ears to hear. That's He's right. speaking all the time. All the time. You know, there are people that, who say that God didn't speak in the intertestamental years <laughs> between the Old and the New Testament. It's not true. That's not true. God has always been speaking. Always. He just had a hard time finding somebody who had an ear to hear. That's right. Hardness of heart is a big thing. You know, something to be said about this, and this is what I find um, the most challenging for hearing God or solving the enigma or hearing God for yourself is clutter, just cl busyness, uh, offense is a big one. If you're in the middle of strife and turmoil or some kind of difficult challenge, it can be really hard to hear the voice of God. And those things come to clutter up the water, to muddy the water so you don't hear God. And that is why we've got to maintain the Word of God in our heart. That's why we got to read, that's why we got to pray, and you will begin to hear God. And it's great that we eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, but especially that we prophesy. When you hear God and you have an unction and a desire to prophesy, it doesn't make you a prophet, but you can do it and you will solve enigmas that way. You will see things, you will hear things. You know, I say this a lot, but if things are too small, men fight, you know, the body of Christ. But if things are big enough, men unite. And I believe the Lord is looking for a unification. Would you say that again? If things are too small in the body of Christ or in the world, that's when men fight, they squabble. But if something is monumental and big enough and you recognize it, that's when people unite. I like that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. But when they do that, that is something that's worth recognizing and applying towards these type of prophetic gifts. Because the body of Christ needs to hear God like never before. We need to be in tune with him like never before. And I believe there's been a lot of shrapnel, a lot of religion that has come against the prophetic. A lot of friendly fire. A lot of friendly fire. They do it to themselves. <laughs> They're like, I will step on that rake and enjoy it. <laughs> you know? And a lot of people do that when it's not necessary. What we really need to do is come back to the simplicity of the Word of God, celebrate these gifts, right-size them, and, and develop them through the Word of God. 
Well, I just want to say we're told not to despise prophecy. That would also mean prophets. And I said in a previous program this week that there's a lot of nutty stuff on YouTube. And there really is. There is. A lot of nutty stuff. <laughs> and it's pretty entertaining. Some of it's pretty distressing. Yes. And uh, make sure you tune into a voice that you can respect and follow. We're told to know those who minister among us. It's good. For me, Joseph, I don't even listen to the news yeah. until I know where the re reporter went to school. Wow. Where they were trained, because that's going to be the slant of the news they're going to give me. That's right. So when Denise and I are watching the news, I'm online looking up that person. Where did they go to school? Where did they get their education? I, w I want to know who's bringing me the news. Wow. In the same way, you need to know who's ministering to you. Who do they run with? Who's in their circle? Who are they in submission to? And if you're listening to somebody on the internet or on YouTube and they're not connected to anybody else, you need to be very careful. It's true. The Bible calls those people wandering stars. Mm. They might be real stars, but they're out of orbit. They're not moving in orbit with anybody else. That's always a signal that you need to be very careful of that person. Well, that's one of the words in Matthew 24, Rick, the cause to wander. Cause to wander. That's what false prophets do. They cause to wander. People may not be fully deceived in their salvation, but they never acquire or attain their calling and purpose. It's one reason why I'm so committed to the group that I orbit with. Yes. I mean, I want to be in a good group of people who love God, love each other, and who will correct each other, help each other. Yes, sir. It's so very important. We need to have a balanced view of prophetic ministry, prophets, mm -hmm. prophecy. And that's what we're talking about this week, demystifying the prophetic. It is so good. I read this book from cover to cover because I deeply care about Joseph and his wife, Heather. Thank you, sir. And I felt like this was going to become one of the foundational books of his ministry. So I wanted to be a part of going through it, reading it, understanding it, so I could recommend it to you. And thank you. And I'm for telling you, it is a great book. And Joseph has such a humble spirit that when I had a suggestion to change something, he just said, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. There's a lot of humility in this book. And the back of the book says, how to identify real and false prophets, how to activate a clear-minded prophetic lifestyle. You can have a prophetic lifestyle. You can. How to master your gifts and experiences, interpret trances, dreams, entities, deja vu. Now that's interesting. It I is. was amazed about that when I read this. Yes. And strange phenomena, how to recognize the four types of prophets operating in the church, government, and marketplace. What are we going to do today? Well, sir, we're going to talk about the four different types of prophet and prophecy. Let's do it. Okay. Well, going into this, we got to understand something. There's a difference between prophets and the gift of prophecy. Okay. And the things we're going to talk about apply to both. They apply to both. In other words, a prophet is someone who has a responsibility to the body of Christ, a segment of the body of Christ, and the gift of prophecy is available for everyone. And so what we're going to talk about applies to both of those categories. So, By the way, I cover some of this in my book, yes, Apostles you do. and Prophets. Excellent, by the way. But I don't cover it in the depth that you cover it in this book. I mean, what you have done in here is just amazing. Well, okay, let's go on. Uh, your book, Apostles and Prophets, is magnificent. Oh, right, Thank you. So there are four different types of prophet and prophetic flows. Now, you can have a major and a minor. In other words, you might have a strength in one and a less of a strength in another, but you move in both, just one less than the other. There is four types, so I'll just label them right now. It's Rowe, Navi, Chesa, and Chose. Okay, in my book, I only covered two of those. Okay. But you cover four. Four. Okay. <laughs> Three of the four are mentioned in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 29, when it talks about uh, the acts of David, the king, the first and last. Behold, they're written in the book of Samuel the seer, in the book of Nathan the prophet, and in the book of Gad, the seer, those are three of those four listed there. And seer listed there actually really can be used for both the last two, meaning Chesa and Chose. Now, I'm using a lot of terms here, but I'll... Now, you're not talking about the simple gift of prophecy that just operates in a congregation. Correct. You're talking about prophetic individuals who stand as fivefold ministry prophets. Yes. And this gifting can also work in people with a gift of prophecy. Okay. Yep. But the... The gift of uh, prophecy works this way. Rowe, number one, Rowe, is a visionary prophetic gift. It's a visionary prophet. It's someone that sees or knows what to do. They know what to do. 
things that are happening. So there's a lot of what I like to say, CEOs, sometimes that run companies that just know what to do. There might be a leader of a nation that just knows what to do. They have a sense, they can feel things and they know how to act. They have an ability to say, I know what to do about this. I'm reading the terrain. I know what must be done. That is a form of a roway prophetic unction. They just know it's a visionary. They know how to do things. When God called you to do things you're doing here, Rick, as an apostle of the Lord, the way you lead and have a, a flow, there's a lot of row way you move in. You just find yourself doing things that are profound in this nation. Thank you. And I think it's wonderful. So you, you definitely move in this. But row is a visionary thing. It's like a sons of Issachar anointing. First uh, Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, it talks about there were the sons of Issachar, that they did three different things. They knew the signs of the times. They could understand them. Then they knew what to do about them. And many people stopped there. They knew the signs of the times. They could discern them. And they knew what to do about them. But thirdly, they also knew their chiefs and their brethren that were with them. That meant they had good tribal alignment. So they knew what was going on in the culture. They knew what to do, but they were aligned with the right people. Now, many people in the prophetic are not. They know what to what, do. What does that mean, aligned with the right people? It means that you are with who God called you to be with. It means you're with your church family. You're with the people God's anointed you for. Uh, you're with your right people to do a specific assignment. I say it this way. Um, if you're with your people, you'll fulfill your destiny. Uh, you, if you're with the right people, you'll know your calling. And when I met you, for example, there was a piece of my life that came into order and I knew God had put me on a trajectory to really hit the target. Mm. And uh, so you're my tribe, Rick. Wow. <laughs> so Roway. Okay. That's number one. Roway is a visionary mobilizing prophetic ability, prophetic gift or office gift. Okay. They mobilize. Two, Navi, N-A-B-I. And it's pronounced like Navi, like the... Uh, there's a movie called Avatar, the Navi, uh, but it's pronounced that way, but it's N-A-B-I. Now, this is the most common form of prophetic. This is a bubbling up or a herald, one who declares and gives information like a trumpet. Navi has an inspirational gift. It's almost as if somebody has studied, teaching, they're getting ready to do what they're going to do, speak, and then they go extemporaneous. They go off the page and they begin to reveal information that they were not even really into. Suddenly it just comes out of them from the Word of God and it bubbles up and they have an inspiration and they release it in a meeting, even as they're teaching. It's an inspirational gift. Navi is a bubbling up. They just suddenly get an effervescent rush from the Spirit to say something. And that's what that means. It's very inspirational. Navi is also one that declares, foretells, and foretells the, the future or what's happening, but through inspiration. The third one, and this is important, is Chaza. Now, Chaza is a unique one. It means a number of things. And these are Hebrew words. They're Hebrew words. That's correct. Chaza means to look and continue to look. And one of the words it uses, and I don't want to emphasize the word because it has connotations to it, but really it means to gaze. It means to it's stare. Just, so it's really looking into the spirit realm. That's what it is. That's what it is. There's perversions of this in other areas. In the occult. In the occult. But in the natural, or in the, I should say, in the spirit, the way God calls us to, there's a looking that happens. I call it seeing and saying. So there's times with Chaza where you will look. That's where we get word of knowledge. That's where you'll get word of wisdom. Things begin to come up inside you, and you know things sometimes by looking in faith at things under the unction of the Holy Spirit. An example of this is in 2 Kings chapter 8 verses 10 through 12. It was Elisha. And he, he says here in verse eight, starting out, and Elisha said to him, go say to him, you shall certainly recover. However, the Lord has shown me that you will really die. Verse 11, uh, jumping to verse 11. Then he set his countenance in a stare until he was ashamed. And the man of God wept. Elisha was staring at this man until the man became ashamed. Like, why are you looking at me like that? He was moving in Chaza. He began to stare until he saw his future. He began to see things that were happening. And of course, this is Hazael. And he said, why is my Lord weeping? And he said, because I know the evil you will do to Israel. He was looking at this man until he saw what was happening. That's Chaza. So that can be a word of knowledge type of setting where you're snapped into something that can either be an intuitive vision or a real vision, like very demonstrative, or a sense you have where you're seeing in the spirit. Now the fourth one, Chose. Chose is a very unique uh, uh, gift. 
it's a very unique thing that happens. This is where we get trances, dreams, uh, profound visions, things of that nature. Chose, it means to behold. It means to look as well, but it also has a sense, Rick, of peering forward or leaning into and look into the distance, like looking into the future. Chose is a futuristic prophetic gift. This is a gift that cannot be induced in any way. It's a gift that the Spirit of the Lord will suddenly drop upon you and bring into your life. And it happened with Daniel the prophet. It happened with John the Revelator. And when these things happen, they begin to look into the distance. Ezekiel 12, 27, it says, Son of man, look, the house of Israel is saying, the vision that he sees is for many days from now, and he prophesies of times afar off. And he's looking into the distance. This is Chose. Chose is the most unique one in a sense. As a matter of fact, David had a prophet with him named Gad. Mm -hmm. And Gad was one of those that was very much moving in Chose. When it talks about him being a seer, mm -hmm. that's one of the Hebrew words used for him, that he would peer into the distance and David would say, tell me what's going to happen. And so that's a gift that's very powerful. Now, I've had some of these experiences in my life. I know that you have. I know many people have. But Chose is really where you walk into what I believe is a trance. Trances or seeing the future. And it's something that the, only the Lord can induce. So those are the four types of flows. You can get into them, we can, we can explore these, but truly, I find that many of them are misunderstood in the body of Christ. I believe Roe is a gift you will find yourself in if it's the way God's marked you. I believe Navi is a gifting that will suddenly manifest on, on people and is probably the most common one. Chesa, I believe, is a practiced gift that has to be under the unction of the Spirit. You have to be moved along by the Holy Spirit, but that is where you practice word of knowledge. And not, I'm not saying practice to just engage it, but you begin to follow the voice of the Holy Spirit and he will lead you and he will guide you. Well, you can, you can develop, you know, you don't develop the gift, but you develop your soul's ability to operate with That's the gift. That's right. Yes. Well, we can speak in tongues. Right. We can suddenly say, I'm going to speak in tongues and then you can stop it or start it. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the control of the prophet. First Corinthians uh, 14, 32. And we recognize that means that there are times that you can and you can also withhold from doing some of these things. But word of knowledge is very important. As a matter of fact, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, when you get down to the middle and end of the chapter, it says if all prophesy, it says that the secrets of their hearts are revealed and That's they'll right. fall down on their face. It does two things. It convinces and it convicts. It's interesting. So it's for the unbeliever and maybe a person that doesn't have a spirit-filled walk. That's what the body of Christ is capable of doing. All right, now I want to ask you of those four. Yes, sir. Which primarily do you operate in? On a day-to-day -day basis, I would probably operate in Navi when I begin to teach and open the Bible. When I go to my whiteboard on my program and I begin to go into things, I step into Chesa. Chesa is when I begin to see and I begin to hear and I begin to try to sketch out what I'm seeing. Um, for the benefit of the body and of course having my sails up being in the holy spirit being rooted in the word of god and doing that every now and then i've had a chose encounter but we can move in all four of these but there are majors and minors so the most common for me would probably be in a day-to-day -day operation navi and roe those would probably be my two. i don't talk about it very often but i move in some of those i know that i do i see things in the spirit and so I have a great appreciation for prophetic ministry. I really do, friends. But I have a better appreciation for prophetic ministry that is also well-balanced in the Bible. That's right. And that's why I appreciate Joseph. Joseph loves the Word of God. That's right. And his book is filled with the Bible. This is not just theory or just experience. By the way, experience is important. It is. But it never supersedes the Word of God. Never. And this book is just loaded with Scripture about prophetic ministry, but I move in some of that as well. And, I, and I'm thankful. But you know what, Joseph? I just don't, I don't often tell what I see, but often I see things and I know it's just for me. It, it helps me to know where I'm headed, where the ministry is headed. The gifts of the Spirit are essential for us. They are not optional. It's true. Well, I'll tell you, you know, without going into all of it, but you and I have had some wonderful conversations and you move in a gift of prophecy in that whole spectrum in a way that uh, is unlike many people I've met. 
and I'm very honored and thrilled to be with you. Well, I feel the same about you. Well, thank you, sir. All right, what else do you want to tell us today? Well, when we understand these gifts, the word chose, we were talking about that, that one that talks about trances, mm -hmm. dreams, revelatory mm -hmm. things. I believe there's much more happening in the realm of the spirit than we might understand. And God gives us glimpses and we're to seek him in this. I, I, I'm reminded of the encounter that Moses had on uh, when he was hidden in the cleft of the rock mm -hmm. and the Lord began to appear to him and Lord, Moses says, show me your glory. I want to see it all. And I find this very fascinating. I think this is in the Chose spectrum. God says to Moses, I, no man can see my face and live, mm -hmm. but I will show you my back. I'll show you my hinder parts. I will show you behind. And I find that interesting. And the Hebrew word there is a core, Rick. It's a very interesting word, a core. And so Moses is seeing, and I believe in that moment, a, a chose happened to Moses. And I believe he was taken in a trance and shown the book of Genesis. I believe that's when he began to write. He began to write out in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and all these things. And Moses began to write. I believe there was a chose experience in that. The unique part of this is, now we'll let everybody just discern this and decide what's biblical or not, but I thought about it and that word accor has to do with going back and it also has the connotation of going forward, which I find very interesting. I don't know where this starts and stops, Rick, but the word accor mentions that it means going forward and in a north direction. And so when Moses had this encounter where he was shown the glory of the Lord, I believe he was not only shown the backwards parts of God from the beginning, mm -hmm. he may have had a snapshot of the future. We well, you know God is outside of time. He is. You know, if, if we're linear, we tend to look at what's right in front of us and behind us, but God is above time. Yes. He can see the past and the present all at once. Yeah. And sometimes when you move in these realms, you see snapshots of the past, you see things in the future. Yeah. And I think part of the wisdom of a, a prophetic brother is knowing how to interpret all of that. That's and interpretation right. is another issue we need to talk about. Very important. And we will. We will get into it heavily, actually. That's where people make a lot of their mistakes. They really do. They do. Well, Moses, maybe, that's when he, maybe, showed up and met Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Isn't that something? Maybe. Very interesting. He went backwards, and in that moment, he said, show me your glory. The Lord said, I can't show you my face, but I'll show you backwards. And the Hebrew word is, there's a brief moment of forwards. Now, I like what you just said. You said, maybe. Maybe. And that's important. It is important. Because sometimes when we deal with issues, we don't know. Yes. It's, it's a maybe. It's like on this set, I've got those dinosaur bones right up. <laughs> yes. And the reason I have them is because we don't know everything. I don't know where they fit in history. Yeah. And so we, we have to deal with what we really know is revealed. That's right. And if we get to an area that's a little fuzzy, uh, we need to honestly say maybe. Maybe. And I, that's very respectful. I think it's good because, you know, there's a lot to be interpreted in the Word of God. But wouldn't it be interesting if that was the case? It really would be. I've never heard that in my life. Well, backwards and forwards. And then the Lord said, no man can look at my face and live. The connotation there could be again, mm -hmm. that the Lord said, I can show you this, I can show you that, but I can't show you everything at once. Mm -hmm. If you see my face, the perpetual knowing of everything, it'll wipe you out. That's amazing, Joseph. We were going to talk about interpretation. Yes. So let's do it. Okay. Well, I'll start by saying this. Prophecy. After all the, everything from election prophecies to the crazy nuances we've seen, or people visiting heaven about 20 times a day, all the things that we've experienced, you right. know, that we've seen people do. I believe that the Lord wants a better hermeneutic. You know, the Apostle Paul, he, by the way, he also, he was not just an apostle, he was a prophet. Yes, he was. He, he states that he did not go to heaven every day. And when he did go to heaven, he didn't even have a release to tell everything that he saw. That's right. Now, that doesn't mean you can't share things that you see. But when you talk, when you hear people on the YouTube, and just day after day, and every day it's something else and something else. And yeah. now I just, just spent another day in heaven, and I saw Elvis. And I mean, I, if I had hair, I would pull my hair out. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's just sensationalism. It really is. And it discredits real prophets like you. Thank you, sir. So anyhow. Well, a better hermeneutic is what we need. It's, uh, it's uh, the art and science of interpretation. 
because God's always speaking. He's not holding back his voice, but his kids get a little mixed up sometimes. And so we've got to begin to bring order to it. And I think that there's been such a market for sensationalism mm -hmm. that I couldn't give a thus saith the Lord on this, but I do believe that the Lord allowed some of these things to be missed by many prophetic voices to bring in order to it, to bring a right sizing, to bring in a personal accountability and to bring a better form of prophecy, not to hurt the body, not to hurt people, mm -hmm. but to bring a better quality, the kind that Jesus paid for. You know, I think that the people who are prophetic or claim to be feel the need to have something new and sensational all the time. That's right. And, you know, in my book, Apostles and Prophets, I, I say that a prophet is like the sail of the ship. That's right. If the wind's not blowing, a ship can't move. And likewise, if the Spirit of God is not moving on a prophet, he does not have any right to just generate and self-propel prophecy. He's got to wait for the Spirit of God. And That's when the right. Spirit of God is quiet, you've got to be quiet. Now, one thing I appreciate about you, and I've asked you and asked you and asked you about it, because I watch you all the time, is you're working on that whiteboard. And I say to you, yes, how do you see all this? Mm -hmm. How do you do this? And the first thing you do every morning is you get up and you spend time with God and that's read right. your Bible. Oh, that's right. That is foundational. That's right. That is foundational. Yep. The Word of God has got to be the root of it all. It has to be. Well, one of the first conversations I had with you is, you know, I'm, I'm at this age, I'm at this tenure, what do I do? And you said, well, you read your Bible every day. You stay close to your wife and you do your push-ups. That's my interpretation. And I thought that was profound. And I thought, my goodness, that is a word from God. You know, the Lord spoke something to me all the way back before the election cycle took place, the last one, back in 20. Right before that, the Spirit of the Lord spoke something to me and said, I don't need you as much right now. I need you after this election cycle. Isn't that interesting? He told me. And the temptation would be to really try to get out and, and, and say something and do something. But he told me, I need you after and then he also told me that the particular candidate that everybody had been talking about was not going to win. And so I declared that because I felt prompted to. And well, I'll tell you, Rick, people did not appreciate that. But after the fact, I feel the Lord has brought us and many people like us to help bring an order and a right sizing to this beautiful gift he's given the body of Christ. I think one mistake people make is they sense something in the spirit. It's not a thus saith the Lord. It's, it's not a prophetic word, but, you know, it's like it, it, you can feel things in the spirit. That's right. And sometimes you jump ahead. Yes. And you add your own interpretation to what you're feeling. That's right. And that's when you mess up. That's right. And that's what I want you to talk about. Okay, sir. Well, there's three things we talk about with interpreting what God said, and I call it this, revelation, interpretation, application. And that's where I use this phrase, a better hermeneutic, meaning the art and science of interpretation. There's got to be a better way. Now, maybe this isn't the best way or the only way, but I think it's a better way than, than what I've seen or experienced. And all of that's in this book? It is packed into this book. It's so good. Revelation, interpretation, and application. So let's talk about revelation first. Okay. A revelation is where you have an supernatural encounter. It's where like the light bulb goes on. It's where you're in worship, you're in a meeting, you're praying, and suddenly something explodes inside you or in your mind or it's just illuminated and it's an aha moment. Guess what the Greek word is for what? illumination? Fatidzo. Fatidzo. It's where you get the word for a photograph. Really? So when you have a divine illumination, it's like a brilliant flash of light. You see something that leaves a permanent impression on you. Wow. And it's it's divine. Wow. So it's like revealed information or knowledge. Just bam, you Blast. see it, you know it. Wow, that's amazing. So revelation is the beginning point. So everybody has that at some point. If you're walking in the spirit, you'll have it. Now, the problem is many times people get a revelation and they just run after it. They go after it. They do exactly what they saw without any process. And that's a mistake. Well, process is important. It is. It is. And when people do not process, they end up missing God. They miss the timing. And that is where we get to interpretation. So you have a revelation. Now you got to begin to interpret what you heard. And that's so important when you do this. I like this scripture where it says in Acts chapter 15, uh, verse 23, it says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And to us. 
that we should do a certain thing. When the Holy Spirit's speaking, He is speaking. But there's also that seeing through a glass dimly. There's that part where you say, I need to be in tune to the Lord enough with discernment mm -hmm. and revelation by the Word of God to ascertain and grasp the confines of the Word of God and what He's saying and how I should act on it. Mm -hmm. And I think of this, James chapter 1, verse 23, it says, For if any man is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. That again is when you're talking about a revelation, many times you're in a moment where the Spirit speaks or something's happening, you're reading the Word, something illuminates to you, mm -hmm. you walk away from it and go, wow, that's what it was, and you can lose, I hate to say it this way, but the voltage of that moment, and then you kind of forget what it was. You forget what God was really saying to you, and that's why you get to bring interpretation to it. It seems good to me that there's discernment needing to be added to this issue. You know, Joseph, when Denise and I were newly married, I saw something in the spirit. I mean, I clearly, it was a divine, it was a fotidza moment. I was illuminated. Wow. What I saw was accurate. And I thought it was for right now. Wow. What I saw was right. My timing was wrong. There it is. My interpretation was wrong. And the things that I saw are now happening in my life. Amazing, right? I saw correctly, but I, my process was not right. So I messed up early on wasn't that what God said was wrong. My interpretation was wrong. There it is. I, I had the same thing, Rick. I, I was working for a job and I was going to go and be a part of a ministry and do all these things. And I had the word of the Lord come to me. I am calling you into full-time ministry. I had another prophet come to me that same weekend. The Lord says he's calling you into full-time ministry. A third one came, a third word. The Lord is calling you to leave that work and go into full-time ministry. So I went and quit. I shouldn't have done that. I should have prayed and walked the process out. Two weeks later, that company had massive pay, uh, layoffs. And I would have been taken care of for six months. Because company. you would have received compensation. Compensation. But I just ran ahead. I had a true revelation, like you're saying. And my interpretation, the timing was off in the application. I think that the interpretation the applications where people miss it. Application is so vital. I think it's actually the most important piece because application comes from knowing what you ought to do and when you ought to do it. And quite frankly, application is doing the revelation and interpretation with the right timing, the right people skills, the right common sense. It's important to have common sense and prophecy. Mm -hmm. People hear a word from God, they go run, they go crazy, they love to run around the building, they have their experiences, and I am so for that. But so many of those people will do that again in 10 years, having never gotten the results from the first time they had a revelation. But God wants us to get the results. He wants us to walk away with results. And one of the things I recognize is when you realize Hebrews 5.14, it says those who through reason of use have their senses exercised mm -hmm. to discern good and evil. They will know when to do the right timing, when to walk into it, when to apply what they've heard. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, revelation is huge. It's wonderful. And this is where so many people miss it and they mess things up. There's a, actually an account in scripture. We were talking about this earlier mm -hmm. where there's two prophets. Oh, this is so good. There's two prophets and it's fascinating. Two prophets. One, well, we might have heard these guys know who they are. One is Ezekiel and one is Jeremiah. And these two prophets both prophesied about the same king. Now, this is really applicable to revelation, interpretation, and application. But these two prophets had a same word or rather two different seeming words towards the same king. The king's name was Zedekiah. And so it seemed like they had conflicting prophetic words. That's right. One said, and this is uh, Ezekiel, he said of our king Zedekiah that Babylon is coming, they're going to invade the area, and you're going to be impacted by this. Ezekiel said to the king Zedekiah, you will not see Babylon. Then we recognize that... So Jer who's right, who's wrong? Well, Jeremiah then says, after Ezekiel says, you will not see Babylon, Jeremiah comes along and says, you shall go to Babylon. One says, you will never see it. And the other one says, you will go to it. So Ezekiel says, you're not going to see it. Don't worry, King Zedekiah, you'll never see Babylon. 
Jeremiah said, you're going to go to Babylon. So Josephus, the early church historian that you could educate all of us on, actually said he looked at these two contradictory words. He so thought they were off that he threw both of them out. He said, that is not of God. And he rejected both prophecies. But he should have kept reading scripture because what we find in 2 Kings 25 is what happened is that Zedekiah was brought up before the king of Babylon. And in that moment, Rick, they gouged his eyes out. And when they gouged his eyes out, then they led him to Babylon. So he went to Babylon, but he never saw it. He never saw it. They were both right. Both prophets were accurate. Isn't that something? Wow, it really shows how we need each other. It does. Because our gifts complement and bring more of a fullness and a correction to what God wants to say. It's God's way. It's God's best. He loves it when the body works together in unity. You know, I think about Agabus because the Bible tells us that Paul had been in Philip the Evangelist's house. He had four daughters that prophesied. That's right. So he had been in their house, the Bible says, many days. Many days. Four daughters that prophesied, they were four prophetic girls. Yes. In the four days they had been there, they never prophesied about Paul's future. But then Agabus showed up. <laughs> yes, he did. And they made room for his gift. Yes. And when Agabus showed up, he saw what those other four prophets never saw. So powerful. And to me, that shows that no one has it all but by himself. You, we need all of us to bring the full message, where it's prophecy, whether it's teaching, doesn't matter what it is. We all need everybody's pieces. That's right. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, we prophesy in part. Yes, sir. The Greek says, in pieces. In pieces. In pieces. How about that? And it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, we all have pieces. Mm -hmm. But we have to all bring our pieces together to see the whole picture. Yes. And that's what I think about those two prophets. They had to bring their pieces together for those prophetic words to really be complete. And I think that's where humility comes back in too, because a it lot does. of times when you're around prophetic ministry, many times people are always trying to outdo the other one, trying to have a better word. Well, that's already a wrong spirit. It is a wrong spirit. That's it. We're, we're already off if that's what they're doing. I like to joke with other prophets where I say, hey, uh, you're good. How am I? <laughs> <laughs> but I really do believe it's important that we have to have humility one to another because we need each other. And what you just said in pieces is so vital. Um, it's so important that we begin to recognize revelation, interpretation and application and how it applies to the local church, how it applies to regional areas, how it applies to national and maybe global words. And I believe the body of Christ really can have a better hermeneutic, the mm. art and science of interpretation. We begin to pull these things together. I believe the Lord wants to, I think he wants to tell us things more than we want to hear them. We just need to have a better formula for doing it. You know, think about 1 Corinthians 14. It says everybody can prophesy. Yes. And then one can be quiet and another can speak. I mean, everybody has a piece to add. That's right. I think it's it's so beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful when it all comes together. It's a tapestry. Well, you know, there's a lot of these experiences we need to learn how to navigate. Navigate. I like where this is going. Can we talk about that in the next program? I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, you know, a lot of people have kind of felt shipwreck because a prophetic word was given to them and they did it and it didn't happen. Maybe they didn't go through the right process. That's right. Or maybe somebody prophesied in part, yep. but they prophesied like they had the whole thing when in <laughs> fact they didn't. Or maybe somebody just felt something in the spirit and they spoke before they should have. Or they added their own interpretation yes. to what God said. That's another big mistake. It's, it's gainsaying. Joseph and I are going to pray for you right now. Father, yes, we thank you for speaking to us this week about spiritual things, particularly about the gift of prophecy and thank the prophetic you, gift Help us to understand it. We thank you, Lord. You gave these things to us because we need them. Help us to understand them and embrace them. In Jesus' name, Jesus. Amen. amen. I wanted to say a very special thank you to our partners. Partners, thank you. Whether you've been a partner with us since the very beginning, the early days, or whether you've recently become a part of our partner family. I want to just simply thank you. Because of you, we're able to do so many things that we could never have accomplished without you working with us together. We're so grateful for you. And from the very bottom of our hearts, we wanted to say thank you to you. And we pray for you every day and we stand with you. And we're believing God is going to do magnificent things through this partner family in the coming days. 
As a matter of fact, I have a promise from the Holy Spirit about it. Now, if you want to become part of our partner family, or you're even on the fence about it, thinking about it, I would encourage you to do so today by going to josephz.com, or you can text the keyword give to 719-259-0029. Your partnership helps us advance the gospel, and it helps us fulfill the commission God's given us to raise up a million to reach a billion. That's lives. A million clear-eyed, clear-minded reformers to go win a billion. A million for a billion. And we know we can do it with your help. I believe with your help, we can impact the world. And we're looking forward to stepping into this at a greater capacity than ever before. I just want to say thank you and invite you to the family by going to josephz.com today. Well, I'm standing here outside our World Broadcast Center. Now, with the World Broadcast Center, we have a little bit extra land that's on it. Not much, but just enough that if we wanted to add on, we could. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. But right now, I want to thank so many of you who've participated in making this building what it is. Now, we're getting to the point we're going to take a major lunge forward by faith and by really good planning. And that has to do with television and advanced media. Now we're already taking dramatic steps. One very exciting thing that's happening is the Sid Roth Network has reached out to us and they're having us air our live broadcasts every day simultaneously with their television network. A simpler way of saying it is, when we go live in the morning, they will air that live on their TV network. And I gotta tell you, it is amazing what the Lord's doing to open doors for us and our partners to reach more and more viewers and people all around the world. But to really accomplish this, we've got to develop a call center, a call center that's going to really help you and your family. We want to minister to you more. We want to be able to be present for you in a greater capacity. The way we want to move forward is with a new call center. And I'm talking high touch that beats high tech every time. What does that mean? It means when you call in that you get somebody. We're here for you in real time during our live broadcast. And we have a place that will reach out and minister to you, our partners. And we just want to be here for you. If you're a viewer, a partner, we want to be available. And we have to make a place or more room for the production of our materials, meaning shipping out books to you and teachings and so much more that we are just getting into right now. And that means we have to finish this building. And to do that, we need your help. We need your help through your donations, your time, anything that you can do. By time, I mean prayer, in any way that you can spend your efforts through prayer and faith with us, we so appreciate it. But more than anything else, we're looking for partners that will help us finish this building. And if you have any interest in really sewing into this today and standing with us over the World Broadcast Center, the total cost that we have left to knock this out, to get done with phase one, we're calling it phase one because it's the studios, the building payment to pay it off in full, and in addition to that, to remodel everything inside is 1.2 million. And we're looking to knock that out this year. We need your help. We wanna see this advance and we're thrilled about it. And I wanna say a huge thank you to all of you who've helped with this so far. You've sown, you've stood with us, but we have a little bit more to go. And I'd encourage you to do so today by going to josephz.com and helping us finish up this project so we can move forward and better serve you and the body of Christ. We're so grateful. Remember, it's a million for a billion. And here we are at the World Broadcast Center, and I believe that we together can get this done very quickly. I love you, I bless you, and thank you for your support. I wanna tell you about an amazing opportunity that has just been presented to us. We've had a supernatural door of opportunity open for us. Only God could do what is happening for this ministry right now. And it is involving television, network television, satellite television, going all over the world. Now, there's a lot in store for this, but let me explain. This is a word God's given us to reach a billion people for the gospel. And I feel an urgency for this coming year to advance and go forward because of the uniqueness of what God has spoken in this ministry and through this ministry in media. 
And here's what we have to do. To accomplish this, we not only have to buy the airtime, but we have to build out a call center and finish this building. And we are in the middle of it right now, but the timeline has just been sped up to fall time so we can be ready for the first of the year when we're gonna to begin to launch out in television in a monumental way. Now we've had an opportunity that is both fiscally responsible and financially amazing the way God has done this for us. And we have to take opportunity right now with it because it won't last long. So here's what I'm asking you. Would you consider supporting us, helping us build out the call center, helping us finish off this building and helping us with the budget of airtime? And it is gonna be a monumental thing and the Lord has given us favor and I can't wait to tell you more and more about it. But if you would consider partnering today over this, I know we can hit this target, I know we can walk through the door, and I know we can raise up a million to go win a billion. And I'm telling you, this is a God moment. It's a now word. And I'm asking you if you consider partnering with us over it. Maybe you wanna become a partner, or if you are a partner, maybe you'd consider increasing your partnership today, or giving a one-time offering. This is an amazing open door for this ministry and this broadcast. Everything we've prayed about, everything the Lord has told us to do is now coming to this monumental moment. Next year, we're gonna reach the masses like never before, but we need your help. Please consider going to josephz.com right now and supporting this amazing open door. Thank you so very much. Well, you know, we're so excited to share that uh, Joseph Z is now a programmer on Daystar. And his show, Voice of God, is dedicated to prophetic jour journalism and faith-filled Bible teaching for the last days. You'll hear unique commentary and biblical teachings that will empower you to see the world through a watchman's lens so you'll know what's coming and what to do about it. And of course, this program debuts this Thursday at 10 p.m. Mark that down. Those of you that love Joseph, and uh, that's 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And here's a look at what you can expect. I'm Joseph Z, and at the age of nine, I had a life-altering encounter with the voice of God. Throughout my life, I discovered God is always speaking. The question is, are you listening? There's a difference between the office of the prophet and the gift of prophecy. Simply put, the office of the prophet is a responsibility to a segment of the body of Christ. You see that in Ephesians 4, verse 11, 12, and 13. Office gifts are there to edify and equip the body. Where when you look at different abilities in the body, such as the gift of prophecy, there's not an assignment to the segment of the body. It's not a responsibility. It's just a gift that a person in the body carries. When a person with a gift of prophecy has a responsibility put on them for the body of Christ, a certain section of believers, they are called to step into that with responsibility. That's the difference between the office of the prophet and the gift of prophecy. All right, I'm excited about that, aren't you? Absolutely. Joseph's Joseph a great teacher. I love listening to him. New programmer. Personal friend, and it's gonna be you're gonna be encouraged.